Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship. It is lovely to take time together and to connect. Being a little more intentional about a connecting, it's okay. We come to value and appreciate these relationships in new ways. So the hymns for this morning's service are the following. The first one, Voices United, number 229, God of the Sparrow. The offering hymn from Voices United is number 540. Before our prayers of the people, from More Voices, number 90, Don't Be Afraid. And our closing hymn from More Voices, number 145, Draw the Circle Wide. So go get your drums and shakers and tambourines for the end of the service. I've not heard about birthdays or anniversaries for this week, but statistics suggest that someone somewhere in our Sydenham Heritage community must be celebrating something. One birthday I would like to note is Dr. Edward Jenner, born in, 19, in 1749, an English physician considered the father of immunology and pioneered the development of the smallpox vaccinations. We do have a strong science foundation to bring us through this pandemic. And a special anniversary. In 1964, on May 17th, the first Tim Hortons coffee shop opened in Hamilton. Good morning. I need to inform the congregation this morning that it was decided at the board meeting on Wednesday night that we would end the pastoral relationship with Reverend Bill McKinnon as of the end of August 2020. Bill has been our pastoral minister for the past five years. Over that time, we have all grown to know Bill to love Bill, and to certainly appreciate the fine work that Bill has done for us. Unfortunately, financial constraints necessitate this move. There is an ancient Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Bill and I were discussing this week that his time with us has certainly been interesting times. Bill has shepherded us through many changes, including multiple ministers, an amalgamation, and now a devastating pandemic. I want to thank Bill on behalf of the whole congregation for the outstanding work he has done for us. Thankfully, we still have three months to benefit from his considerable pastoral skills. As part of our motion on Wednesday, it is our plan to, when we are more able to associate, invite Bill back to a more formal celebration of his ministry with us. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, Daryl. And my own personal welcome to you this morning. We're glad that you're here and we hope you can stay for coffee time after service. The uh, method to do that will be through Zoom and I will put a link in the chat box for this service. For announcements, I just have a couple of things to add. One is that I was in the church last week and I went into the choir room and I have to say I was stunned how good it looks. Now, I don't think they're quite done yet, but it's been a project that's been on the books for a while. And I want to thank Larry, Tom, Norm, Bill, Terry, Don, and others from the Fix-It Club who have worked so hard on that room. It really looks super. And a reminder that we are having mindfulness groups. Uh, we still have four weeks to go. In that program, feel free to join in. That's Mondays at 7 p.m. and Thursdays at 10 a.m. If you want more detail, just call me up. And the uh, links are in the calendar to join the program. Namaste, the breath of God within me recognizes the breath of God within you. Namaste, the breath of God within me recognizes the breath of God within you. Amen.
For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked in this land. Their relationship with the land is the center of their lives and their spirituality. Today we are gathered on the traditional lands of the Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. We acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We light this candle, the Christ candle, to remind ourselves Christ is present in our midst. Please join me in the call to worship. The Spirit of God moves among us, inviting us into community. The Spirit moves within us, making us one. The Spirit moves through us, bringing healing and wholeness. Let us gather to worship as we embrace the Spirit. Let us join our hearts together in the prayer of approach. Holy mystery, holy love, receive our worship as an outpouring of gratitude and awe. Open us to your still, small voice of comfort and your rushing whirlwind of challenge. Move through our words and music, art and sacrament. Speak our prayers of deepest longing. Enfold our concerns and confessions. Change our lives, our relationships, our world. This we pray in the name of Jesus, your word made flesh, who makes all things new. We are made in the image of God and we yearn for the fulfillment that is life in God. Yet we often choose to turn away from God. God calls us to confess our fears and failings with honesty and humility. And so we sing a song of confession, lament and repentance. Forgiving and reconciling God, we confess the ways in which we surrender ourselves to sin and give in to selfishness, cowardice and apathy. We often become bound and complacent in a web of false desires and wrong choices, bringing harm to ourselves and others. And we are all touched by this brokenness, O oh God. <clears throat> the individualism that erodes human solidarity, the concentration on wealth and power without regard for the needs of all, the toxins of religious and ethnic bigotry, the degradation of the blessedness of human bodies, and the goodness of the earth. 
our complacency with empires and systems of domination. Forgive us, we pray. Renew us and transform us. Amen. And here with gladness, words of assurance. Our God is close to all who call. God receives us as we are, lifts us up, and calls us again to be people of love and mercy, salt and light in a hungry, hurting world. Receive God's pardon and peace. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Whether you take what is written in the Bible as fact, metaphor, myth, or story, listen to these words now for the teaching they hold for you today. From Acts 10, verses 1 through 29 and 44 to 48. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household he gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon, at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius! He stared at the angel in terror and said, What is it, Lord? The angel answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him, and after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They answered, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear what you have to say. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet worshipped him. But Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now, may I ask why you sent for me? While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even to the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, 
Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Within these words, let us hear the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. An update on the What Does Home Mean to Me assignment. I've received some great personal reflections from several of you, but really would like to hear from a few more. So we'll give this another week or two. It doesn't have to be long. A few sentences is fine. Just ponder what home means to you. Many of us have our favorite radio stations. For me, I can't imagine life without CBC Radio. It's an essential service. And these days, I'm spending a lot more time with the radio on. Most of us are dealing one way or another with isolation these last many weeks, and it was really timely to hear recently an interview with a fascinating woman who knows a lot about isolation. Apart from this interview, I found that she had also written a similar piece in The, uh, the Guardian in the UK. Her name is Denise Kafari, and she's a British sailor in 19... In 2006, sorry, became the first woman to sail single-handedly and non-stop around the world the wrong way, westward against the prevailing winds and currents. In 2009, she set a new record to become the first woman to sail solo, non-stop, around the world in both directions. In total, she sailed around the world six times. She's descended from a Maltese sea captain. She knows a bit about isolation. On one of her journeys, she was alone at sea for six months. Here are some gleanings from the interview. She says, my home for that time was a 72 foot boat with very few creature comforts and nothing in the way of entertainment apart from my karaoke skills. Of course, I'm well aware that my isolation was one of choice and for very different reasons than the situation we find ourselves in now. However, in sharing the strategies and learnings from being alone for these long periods of time, I hope that they will resonate with people that find themselves in a similar situation that is unfamiliar and scary. We know we need to be physically, physically isolated right now, but that doesn't mean we have to be mentally isolated. Human contact and support are important at all times, but particularly in times of crisis or stress. Now more than ever, we need to look out for each other. My tips for dealing with isolation are these. Keep communicating. This is reassuring for everyone. If you were the one self-isolating, it's a moral boosting to know people care, but it's equally important for your friends and family to know that you are okay. Stay in touch and ask for help if you need it. A five minute chat once a day could really lift someone's spirits and be something they look forward to. Spending 24 seven alone is alien to most of us and will be a challenge for people that thrive on the company of others. Extroverts get their energy from others. So a lack of stimulation may lead to a drop in mood. For most of us going to work or school or the gym is part of our daily routine and those things are now all different for us and we have to fill that time. Having and sticking to a routine of some sort will help as it provides a focus and a reason to get going for the day. Here's a tricky one for some. Make technology work for you. There are so many ways we can communicate these days. This is the time to make use of them. Skype, FaceTime, email, text, phone calls, social media platforms are all great ways to stay in touch and we're all learning a lot these days about that one. Focus only on what you can control and don't waste energy worrying about things that are outside your control. We're bombarded with information via the media, and we do need to take on board the news that is being distributed. However, if you find that listening or reading the news is increasing your anxiety or stress levels, then limit your exposure to it. Many will be seriously impacted financially through job losses or lack of work. Just remember that you are not alone. Millions will be in the same position. Be grateful for the things in your life that you have or can do. Focusing on the good will have a positive effect on your mental health. When you're having a tough day and finding it hard to cope, 
focus on getting through the next day or even the next few hours rather than weeks or months. The sun will continue to rise and set. This situation will pass. Look for opportunities and be creative. In a world of instant contact, demanding work lives and intrusive technology, the current situation will allow many of us to step back from that for a period. Is there a project you've wanted to take on but never had the time? Necessity is the mother of invention, so perhaps now is the time to embark on something new. Accept that we must adapt to the new environment we are living in. As a round-the-world sailor, I'm used to my environment changing very quickly and having to adapt to forces that are outside of my control. In the coming weeks and months, restrictions on our lives and the effects of this virus will no doubt make us feel angry, upset, worried, and scared. These are natural emotions, but will use mental energy. Trying to accept a situation allows us to think more clearly and calmly. And here perhaps is the most important one. The future will be different. That is the reality, and we may as well embrace it. Mother Nature has flicked the reset button. We have an opportunity to reevaluate and change our lives for the better. We are all too aware in today's world that the only thing we can be certain of is change. Our ability to adapt to this change is what will define us. The current global pandemic is revealing that the majority of us fear the unknown and our reaction is to panic. Let's come together in this time of adversity and support each other. Wise words, all of these. May they be encouraging to us in the days ahead. Have a good week. Let us know if you need us and be well.
Let us pray. O God, in the reading of Scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. You know, I've noticed that we hear a lot sometimes about how we should tolerate people who are different from us. Well, just for the record, I want to tell you I strongly disagree with that statement. I will tell you boldly and without any qualifications that we should stop tolerating people who are different. If that surprises you, I would, however, ask you to give me a few minutes to explain what I mean and to unpack it because I do not mean what Donald Trump would mean if he said those words. I mean something else. I mean something I think is much better. But first, we all know what this is, right? Okay, it's a prism. And what does a prism do? If you went to school in Canada, you probably learned that a prism breaks down white light into its component colors, which you can see in this image particularly if you imagine that the light is going from left to right through the prism. And that's true, of course, but you know that's only half the story. Because a prism does something else, too, that I think is actually more astounding. Because a prism can also be used to take colored lights at different angles and combine them into white light, which you can see in this image as well, if you imagine the light is going from right to left through the prism, this way. <clears throat> well, that's great, but you know, I have to tell you a well-guarded secret. There is no such thing as white light, except in your mind. Remember that light is a wave of photons, and different wavelengths of photons give us different colors. For example, here's the full spectrum of visible light. The colors each have a corresponding wavelength, as you see. For example, green is not a single frequency, but is a band extending from about 490 nanometers to 560 nanometers. But notice in this image, we have the entire visible spectrum. Do you see white anywhere? No, there is no white in the visible spectrum because there is no wavelength that corresponds to white photons. White light does not exist. We still see it, of course. We see what we call white light when the different colors come together, like in this image, and our brains interpret that as white. But there are no photons of light that are white. The effect of white light is created by photons of many different colors coming together. And I mention this because that's how healthy community is created as well. Different people with different backgrounds come together, they retain their individuality, and yet they also create something new called community. In an inclusive community, individuals are celebrated for who they are, not just their ability to fit in. Differences are not tolerated, they are sought out and celebrated. With light, if any one color is missing from the spectrum, you don't get white light out of the prism. You get something muddy. And in our community, we need everybody right here to make this community what it needs to be. If anybody is excluded or some group is excluded, we are not the same community. We become something different. Tolerating people is like filtering out certain colors from the visible spectrum. And so we need to stop tolerating people and start embracing everyone in the community for the gift that they are. And so to put you out of your suspense, that's why I said earlier, we should stop tolerating people. Because tolerating people isn't really very positive. I mean, for example, you can easily tolerate a person by just ignoring them. But then of course you miss out the gift of that person. Our differences should be embraced, lifted up, incorporated, celebrated, not just tolerated. I would say if the best you can do with another person is tolerate them, maybe you want to consider going back and trying a little bit harder. And this, of course, leads us directly to our reading from Acts today, 
which I will argue is the most important chapter in the entire Bible for the church. Wow, did I actually say that out loud and recorded it? Did I just declare Acts 10 to be the most important chapter in the Bible for the Christian church? I guess I did. <clears throat> and I say that because without the story in Acts 10, there would not be a Christian church today. Now, I will agree, on the surface, it's kind of a strange reading. Some guy, Peter, who we don't know a whole lot about, has a dream about a bedsheet full of animals descending from the heavens, and Peter has to decide whether or not to eat the animals. Really? The story sounds at least completely irrelevant, if not completely insane, which is the point, actually, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And so, what happens around here, I've noticed, we need a little bit of history. In two weeks, we will celebrate Pentecost, traditionally taken to be the birth of the Christian Church. And today's reading outlines an important part of that story. It's hard, of course, to pin down the exact beginnings of Christianity. We could start with Jesus as a disciple of John the Baptizer. We could start with Jesus' public ministry with his disciples. But no matter where we imagine the movement started, the Jesus movement, sometimes referred to as the Way, started as a sect within Judaism, which is itself a small group. Their leader, Jesus, and all the disciples were Jewish and would never have heard the word Christian in their lifetime. So how did a Jewish sect become a non-Jewish religion? Well, that's a long story, of course, but one of the early steps in that story was the acceptance of non-Jewish people as followers of Jesus. And most of the book of Acts, in fact, is about the interplay between Jew Jewish followers of Jesus and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. <clears throat> and this happened because the Jesus movement was expanding geographically and theologically. And Acts chapter 10 was actually a very decisive point in the story. And we need to imagine that this transition is not simple or straightforward because the transition had to do with the acceptance of others. The transition had to do with who is an insider and who is an outsider. The transition therefore affected identity. And changes to identity are always difficult, we know that. In a few weeks, we will see that there are many other cultural and religious inputs that went into making up the original version of Christianity, including Roman, Greek, and Egyptian influences, including pagan groups and sun worshippers, including snake handlers and a whole host of exotic groups. As the followers of Jesus expanded geographically, they also expanded culturally, philosophically, ritually, and theologically. Christianity did not simply grow out of Judaism. It was an inclusive project of broad dimensions from the earliest days. But we'll get to that some other time. Today's story is actually simple by comparison. In this story, the only real issue being dealt with is whether or not non-Jewish people could be followers of Jesus. Peter, one of the leaders at the time, clearly felt that only Jewish people could be part of the Jew Jesus movement. But all that changed when Peter had his dream and met Cornelius. To the early Jesus movement, Cornelius was a problem because Cornelius was a devout person who prayed to God and who helped people in need, and he wanted to follow Jesus. But he wasn't Jewish, so how was this going to work out? The early Jesus movement had to make an important decision. Did they want to maintain their cultural identity? Or did they want to maintain their commitment to the principle of inclusivity that Jesus lived and taught? Did the group want to maintain their cultural biases? Or did they want to live a more inclusive life? In summary, the early Jesus movement had to choose between accepting Cornelius or giving up on Jesus. And that's why I argue this is the most important chapter in the Bible for the Christian church. Because if Peter had failed to get the point of the dream, the Jesus Club would have remained a small sect within a small religion. 
it would never have embraced all people as potential members of the Jesus Club. Because Christian principles are fundamentally inclusive. Now, before you correct me, yes, I am very aware that Christians have not always lived out that vision particularly well. The Christian Church has made many disastrous trips, <clears throat> excuse me, trips into racist and exclusivist behavior. We could name the Crusades against Muslims. We could name centuries of support for slavery. We could name the conquest of North America at the expense of indigenous people. There's lots of examples. But those were mistakes, deviations from Christian aspirations, not the way the Christian church should have behaved. The fundamental basis of Christianity from Acts 10 is an acceptance that all people are children of God, period. To quote from the passage, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. So who might we identify with in this story? Perhaps we would identify with Peter. Perhaps we would be part of the established group, the status quo, the people who have been around for a while, and we see that things are changing. We see that we no longer define the cultural norms of our society. Perhaps we really sympathize with Peter. We want things to stay as they are. We want things to stay comfortable for us. Well, if that's you, that's great, but you may have noticed we're surrounded by people who are different from us and who come with many gifts. And I'm sure that we, open-minded people that we are, are all inclusive people, right? Well, maybe, but I'd like to at least point out there are two types of inclusive behavior, which I label active and passive. And passive inclusion is where we say that we accept everyone but we do it by the simple expedient of not really paying a whole lot of attention to those people anyway. We put up with people who are different and we don't attack them, which is good. But at the same time, perhaps we don't really engage with them. We tolerate them, but we don't include them as equals. We don't see them as a gift from God. That's passive inclusion. So what does active inclusion look like? Active inclusion is a reality where we do not tolerate people. Instead, we engage with them, interact with them, and fully expect to learn from them just as they learn from us too. You know, if you feel you're on an equal footing with somebody, there's no need to tolerate them because they're basically a friend. There is only the desire to learn from the other person and to hope that you yourself will grow from the experience. Active inclusion is a state where we can accept other people for who they are without feeling the compulsion either to imitate them or to correct them. Other people get to be themselves and we get to be ourselves. Everybody gets to be themselves. That's healthy community. Active inclusion is healthy. Active inclusion is realizing we are incomplete without the other and that the other person actually might hold a piece to the puzzle of life that we care about. Active inclusion is realizing that all colors are required in order to make white light, and that all of us are required to make a healthy community. Well, we all know this sounds great in principle, and it sounds even better in a sermon, right? But humans have always struggled to live out the vision of inclusion. I regret to inform you that the struggle exists in the Christian church, and the struggle goes far beyond the Christian church too. But that's only because it's fundamental to human nature, which means it's important. I find it a bit interesting that we get this teaching today on May 17th, because May 17th is widely recognized as the International Day Against Homophobia transphobia, and biphobia, which is a worldwide celebration of sexual and gender diversities. Now, the struggle against homophobia, transphobia, and biphobia is very old, of course. But 30 years ago today, one milestone in that struggle was reached. Because on May 17, 1990, the World Health Organization 
removed homosexuality from its official list of diseases. Homosexuality has often been seen as a disease that maybe can be fixed, but 30 years ago today, it was officially declared homosexuality is not a disease at all. Gender and sexuality is one aspect of humanity that continues to be seen as a barrier that separates us from them, that can defy inclusion and therefore defy full community. How do we respond to sexuality and gender here? And by here, I mean here at Sydenham Heritage United Church, but actually I also want to know about Brantford in general, because I don't know yet. Are we inclusive? And if we are inclusive, do we live out a passive inclusion or an active inclusion? May 17th is a good day to lift up gender and sexuality, but a broader question than that even would be, what barriers exist in our own minds that we use to separate us and them? And once we can name the barrier, is that a healthy barrier or not? 2,000 years ago, the Jesus Club struggled to accept non-Jewish people. Is there anyone in our own community that we struggle to accept? Or do we actually live and breathe the idea that we are all connected? And that's a real question. I'd love to hear from you over coffee time or call me up sometime. I honestly want to know what this community thinks. By the way, did anyone recognize this image that was in snippets this week and is on the screen right now? It's a visualization of one way that we are definitely connected. It shows aircraft routes in Europe. The blob in the upper left is England. The bright spot in the upper right, I believe, is Berlin. The lines extending to the left show connections with North America. I think this picture show proves we are all connected but still, it still invites a question. What do we do with those connections? All people are children of God, period. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. We are all connected. Amen. Our calling is to feed those dismissed from the world's tables, that they may no longer feel hungry or alone. As we come to present our offerings at this table, we remember God's generous hospitality. Let us now present our morning offering. Once again, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for those who are contributing to the church right now, either through sending checks to the office or bringing them in, or through PAR, or through making donations online through the website. Thank you very much. Let us join together in the offering prayer. All you who hunger, gather round. All you who thirst for God, listen up. Here are the seeds of something great and good. With these gifts, we give seeds of love and justice to sow in our world. Amen.
Let us join our hearts together as a community in prayer. <clears throat> Creator God, you imagined a world of diverse people who could live in peace. You imagined people who would celebrate differences and individuality. But we pull back from seeing the humanity of our neighbors. We withdraw in fear from people we don't know, from traditions we don't understand. We want to be open-minded, but only so far. We want to celebrate diversity, but only so far. Living among us, you know how hard it is to embrace the other. You yourself once called a woman a dog. You know the sting of religious bigotry from both sides. You know the limitations of human nature. And yet, your spirit calls us to more than this. We are called to live out peace. Your spirit calls us to see the human in each other. Your spirit calls us to see the divine in each other. Your spirit calls us to peace, the salam that comes from the fullness of new life. Your spirit calls us back to your vision of diversity and peace. Your spirit calls us forward to your vision of diversity and peace. Let us continue in prayer with the Lord's Prayer, using the words provided. Our Father in heaven, help us to honor your name. Come and set up your kingdom so that everyone on earth will obey you as you are obeyed in heaven. Give us our food for today. Forgive us for doing wrong as we forgive others. Keep us from being tempted and protect us from evil. For yours is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
we now extinguish this candle, the Christ candle, knowing that Christ continues to be present in us, with us, and through us. Please join with me for the commissioning. Go into the world. We go into the world to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind and with all our strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And as you go to, to love your neighbor, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Thank you.